thank you for joining us today for our first generation professionals FGP discussion featuring ITA Undersecretary Marissa Lago. We are so glad that you were able to join us today. My name is Laura Soria and I work in the Office of Civil Rights as an Affirmative Employment Program Manager. Before we get started, I want to go over a couple of things. Uh, the first one is the That's event the event today. If I can if please I can have everybody that. mute your phones. Thank you. Laura, hey, Laura. Yeah. You're muted, Laura. Laura, I think you got muted. All right. Well, that's a wonderful way to start the program. My apologies for that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for joining us. My name is Laura Soria and I work in the Office of Civil Rights as an Affirmative Employment Program Manager. Before we get started with our program, I'd like to go over a couple of things. The first one is the event is being recorded and will be available for view at a later time. We are currently working out the specific platform that we will utilize for this recording, but it should be available within two to three weeks. And we understand that many uh, were unable to join, but we will make that available. Again, I will ask that you mute your mics and turn off your cameras. This will help us with our bandwidth and allows our speakers to have higher visibility within the event and the recording as well. And as you know, it will also avoid interruptions. Closed captioning is enabled, but if you cannot view the closed captions, you may turn them on by clicking on the three dots at the top of your screen and enabling them for you. ASL interpreter Francisco Roman is going to provide services today for the beginning of the event. If you need ASL services further than that, please just let us know in the chat and Francisco will be sure to be available. Towards the end of the presentation today, we will have a Q&A session. We will ask that all participants who have a question raise their hand and one of us will call your name, at which point you can enable your mic and also uh, turn your camera on. If you choose to ask a question in the chat, that is OK. We will read out your question for you towards the end of the event. If you are having any technical issues, please type them in the chat and we will try to assist you as much as possible. Thank you for joining us today. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you fellow first generation professional, Mr. Junish Aurora. Junish is currently the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer, CDO, at the Department of Commerce. In that capacity, he promotes DEIA and the department's externally focused mission areas service and delivery, including supporting outreach to historically underserved communities and develops and implements internal DEI strategies to fully integrate and sustain DEIA and belonging into the agency's workforce. Junish has held numerous positions, including the Department of Homeland Security, where he served as a deputy director, strategic recruitment, diversity and inclusion. Uh, in the Office of the Chief Human Capital Officer. In that role, he promoted diversity within DHS for its more than 210,000 employees. He led the implementation of DHS DNI strategic plan and ensured components recruitment strategies drew from diverse groups, veterans, and individuals with disabilities. He further provided oversight for the analysis of a full range of DNI metrics. Mr. Aurora has also held positions in the Office of Civil Rights, CRCL within DHS as Director, Diversity Management Section, and Senior EEO Diversity Manager, and also a Senior Complaints EEO Manager. Prior to working for DHS, he served in various EEO positions with the US Patent and Trademark Office, where he joined as a Presidential Management Fellow and served as an EEO Specialist, Final Agency Decision and Fad Writer, and Special Assistant to the Director. Seems to me that it was meant to be for him to return to our wonderful DOC team. 
Uh, Mr. Aurora received his master's in English from the University of Virginia, his JD from the School of Law at University of Texas at Austin, and he is a member of the District of Columbia Bar, and uh, he was honorably discharged from the U.S. Army Reserves. Thank you for your service. He is married and has two raven-haired angels. Junish, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for that kind introduction and for the opportunity to moderate this fireside chat on being a first uh, generational professional or FGP with uh, the undersecretary. And thank you all uh, for attending and carving out some time in your busy schedules to uh, join this uh, this lunch and learn. So I consider myself a first generation professional, though perhaps in a different way. I think that's one of the strengths of diversity is that even within groups, there are nuances that tell different kinds of stories. I'm first generation college and professional in the United States as both my parents went to college in India and were professionals there. As many immigrants experienced, their education and professional credentials weren't recognized when they came to the US. So my parents both had to do their education a second time and re-enter the professional workforce in a new country. For my parents, I definitely learned grit, determination, and the value of a strong work ethic as I saw them juggle work and home, a new culture, and old values. They, as first-generation college and professionals in a new country, didn't necessarily have the tools to understand some of the concepts that make our American uh, economy uh, flourish and the American workplace. So they didn't really have a sense of the value of networking, um, still saw individual accomplishments as more important than uh, teamwork, highlighted technical skills over soft skills, and they could give me advice on having a job, but not really on a career. Those things might not sound like a lot, but they can be built in limitations that can stymie your professional entry, movement and trajectory. Well, one first generation professional that has a remarkable uh, career trajectory is our very own Undersecretary for International Trade, Marissa Laga, who I'm delighted is joining us for this fireside chat. You'll just have to imagine the two of us sitting in cozy chairs by a fireplace on this cold January day. You're muted, Tunish. Oh, apologies. Um, Ms. Lago is the Undersecretary for Commerce for International Trade. She was appointed by President Joseph Biden and sworn in on December 28th, 2021 to lead the federal government's efforts to assist American businesses entering or expanding into international markets, enforce fair trade policies, promote travel and tourism in the United States products and services overseas, provide in-depth trade analysis, develop strategies that will shape the future of international trade, and engage in commercial diplomacy across the globe. Undersecretary Lago has had a distinguished career in public service with expertise in international markets, trade, financial regulation, and enforcement. Before joining ITA, she led the New York City Department of City Planning and the City Planning Commission. In the Obama Biden administration, she served in the Department of Treasury as Assistant Secretary for International Markets and Developments. Ms. Lago has also served as the director of the Boston Redeployment Authority and chief economic development officer for the city of Boston, president and CEO of Empire State Development Corporation, director of the Office of International Affairs for the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and the global head of compliance for a major investment bank. She received her Bachelor of Science in Physics from the Cooper Union and her Juris Doctorate cum laude from Harvard Law School. Welcome, Undersecretary Lago. Well, thank you, Junish, and I also want to thank Lauda and Francisco for their services in pulling this off today. Yes, we want to thank the, the whole team uh, in front of the scenes and behind the scenes in putting together this, this Lunch and Learn. So I thought, Undersecretary, we could start by talking a little bit about your journey as a first-generation professional and then move into some, some lessons learned. So uh, let's take a look at that roaring fire, get warmed up. So you were the first in your family to graduate college. That's a big deal. How did your upbringing prepare you for navigating those uncharted waters? Um, you had talked about the hard skills and the soft skills. 
And I think that my background, my family gave me invaluable soft skills. And the first is yeah. that I had the tremendous good fortune to grow up in a loving family. My parents were married for over 50 years until my father's death. I have three kid brothers who are the delight of my life to this day. Um, and my parents always made us feel fortunate that there was always food on the table. Now, my father would go fishing and fill the freezer that would last us through the winter. We had a victory garden, but we were made to feel special that we could go out to this little teensy garden and get yourself a fresh head of lettuce, a, a bell pepper. So it wasn't something that um, spoke to not having means, but rather was made a positive. My mom made all of our clothes. And of course, when I became a teenager, I wanted the bell-bottom blue jeans, store-bought. My mom made them so much better and embroidered them because of her skills. And so again, something that spoke to be economizing, stretching every dollar, we were made to feel was something special. Uh, we were the family that recycled before it became a thing. Um, we would have a competition among the four of us of who at the end of the week would have the most neatly folded brown bag that we had brought our lunch to school in and my dad to work in each day. And so turning again, things that were of economy into something that was a plus. And I would say probably the biggest was the sense of giving back. Um, as I mentioned, my mom made all our clothes, whether sewing or knitting. And once or twice a year, a ship would arrive in Bayonne where we had learned from a family member that there was someone from my mom's hometown in Spain. And this was a time in the 50s and 60s when Spain was still in a post-World War II Franco torpor. And we would go down to the docks with a duffel bag full of our hand-me-down clothes that my mom had made. And we would give it to the sailor. He would give us back another duffel bag in which were smuggled choritos and also Cuban cigars. Uh, probably shouldn't admit that because that was probably breaking the law at the time. But we were always made to feel good about the fact that we were helping others, including others who we had never met in this town, um, and that that was an important part and part of the pride of being an American, that we had these riches to be able to give back to our home country. That's wonderful. It sounds like your childhood was was idyllic in, in many ways, and um, your your family uh, household was filled with with love and and understanding and values uh, that uh, transcended from 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 childhood to to adulthood. I'm um, certainly uh, I see a lot of those traits uh, still within you um, today. So um. Some first generation professionals have expressed that they hid their humble belongings for fear they would be viewed as less or they might not fit in because of um, those humble backgrounds, especially when when interacting with peers um, that uh, may have come from families uh, whose parents were more affluent, whose, whose parents were educated, who were accomplished in executive spaces. D did you have any feelings like that? And, and if so, was there anything um, that helped you have a sense of pride coming from your, your, your background? Though it sounds like you had a lot of pride uh, from your background. But had what you've discussed is an extreme degree. I think I first became aware of it when I was maybe 12 years old, entering that awkward teen years. I My parents are both graduates of public high schools in Brooklyn, so fluent English speakers. Yeah, but they gave me the gift. Uh, if all could, just, um, you, please. Uh, our phones, please. Our devices. Um, Thank you. They gave me the gift of never speaking a word of English to me, never exposing me to English until I went to kindergarten in Brooklyn. Um, but when I turned 12, I decided I was American. I wasn't going to speak Spanish. And it wasn't until I was 17 and headed off to college that I realized how stupid that was. But I do think that that was part of wanting to, to fit in. Um, I had the good fortune of going to Cooper Union at a time when it was 100% tuition free. 
but I still worked full time because you had to pay rent, you had to eat, you had to buy school books. I didn't put that on my resume because that would say something about your economic status. Today, when I see a line on a resume that says work yeah. full time to finance education, that is worth an extra two points on your GPA because what that says is you want that education. You know time management. You know yeah. how to exist in a workplace. And it should be something that is a, a, a point of pride. Um, one other example, I was brought up with manners, with politeness. But boy, the first time, and it's embarrassing to, to admit this didn't happen until I was heading international affairs at the SEC. I was at a very fancy international dinner. And it's not until then that I had to lean over to the person next to me and say, which is my bread, which is my water, and learning the little trick that you make a B and a D, and the B yes. is the bread and the D yes. is the drink. But I was already a professional well on in my career. There just was no reason to have learned that in my, in my family setting. Um, the final one that I'll mention is I was in law school in my first year and had a lot of very wealthy classmates. Sure. Very smart, very committed, but many of them chose to get a higher education. They didn't have to work a day in their lives. And we were sitting around having lunch and a group of my classmates were talking about the fact that they did not, and I was in with a very progressive lefty crowd. Um, they were talking about how they didn't know if they would be hiring a housekeeper because it, it just was somehow looking down on other people. And I sat there thinking about my mother-in-law who cleaned houses for a living. And by cleaning houses, got three kids with graduate degrees um, and the dignity of her work, the pride that she took in it. And I have to say to this day, I am angry, upset with myself for not having spoken up then. Now you, you talked about the, the pride. I think some of the pride came out in my opening remarks, but I think another point of pride of being a first generation professional is the ability to help my, my family, to help my three kid yeah. brothers get through school. Um, but also I think it's what's driven me to a career in public service, which is the ability to give back the people, folks today, little girls and boys today, are not going to have the same background as I did today. If your family's from Spain, you are from a very wealthy upper income country. They don't look like me. They come from different circumstances than me. But to give that same opportunity, to be part of giving that same opportunity is um, a point of pride and is what keeps me in public service. Thank you. Thank you for sharing um, other aspects of, of your journey. Um, I wish we could uh, spend the whole time talking about that because um, you have such a fascinating, rich life and um, so many stories to share and uh, uh, stories that uh, that still linger with you. Um, like you mentioned, you wish um, you know you could have said something during that, that conversation and in law school to to your peers who were talking about whether or not they would have a, a housekeeper. So. Um, in our audience today, we, we probably have a number of first generation professionals, so we thought we could pass along some 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 advice uh, uh, to them from lessons that you've learned uh, from from your journey. Uh, when you were in your first executive position, uh, what resources helped you navigate that that uncharted territory, such as the the unwritten rules of of the workplace and, and organizational culture? Uh, what information or resources helped you kind of start that professional journey? Um, like, a, was it a company career development program, uh, scholarship uh, mentors, or, or uh, employee groups? Um, so, yeah, when you first got started, what what was available to kind of help you um, get get acclimated to this new this new work world? Well, Janice, I'm 67 years old, so I entered the workplace in a very, very, very different time. Um, and before so many of these resources yeah. existed, I was incredibly fortunate 
in having mentors, in finding a professor and finding a boss who took an interest in me. And um, I hope that I repaid it through hard work, through through loyalty, but just mentors come in many different stripes. And I have to say that I the four most significant people in my professional life have been four old Jewish men. So people with whom I did not share bounds of ethnicity of background. What I do think is has been important is to be a sponge for learning, just to take advantage of being in the workplace and look to see what how other people who you respect are interacting in meetings. Um, observe, but also participate. Um, early on, I was fortunate to be able to backbench in incredibly important meetings. Um, in my job as a special assistant to the chair of the city planning commission, which was my first real job out of law school, I was a bag carrier for the chair. I was, I did whatever needed doing, but I also got to sit in the back bench as he negotiated them with a very well-known real estate developer, Donald Trump. I got to observe wow. how power was wielded for the public good. The other thing that I would advise, and I was not as good at this early on in my career, is that when you're by, and when you're part of a meeting where you are the junior person, you're clearly there to help your principal. As you're in the meeting, before it starts, as it's breaking up, talk to other folks. Talk to folks who are more senior than you. What's the worst that can happen? They ignore you. They brush you off. But you might just strike up that conversation with someone where there's a spark, where you learn something, or who eventually could become a future colleague, um, a future employer. And then the final thing is to ask questions. And I'll again revert back to being seated at this very fancy table and having to lean over to a colleague and very quietly ask, which is my water? Don't be afraid to ask the embarrassing questions. That's that's great um, candid advice. And I'm sure there's a lot more to that story uh, with uh, the, the fr uh, former uh, president uh, in that city uh, zoning uh, meeting. Uh, how, how, how interesting. Um, and I think it's interesting also that you flag that your mentors, four of your most important mentors, were, were different uh, for you, you were, were a different gender, um, uh, a different cultural background, and uh, there, there's value in seeking mentors who are different um, to get their perspectives. And uh, I think a lot of mentorship is is having that right fit, and sometimes it's someone within your group, and sometimes it's it's not. So well, what I'll note, Janish, is I did not have a Hispanic female mentor available yeah. to me in right. the workplace in the in the early 80s. Yeah. And I hope that today, I, today there are, I believe, a wider array of diverse mentors. But the other is to grab your mentorship where you find it, when you just yeah. find the person that you click with who you can learn from. Yeah. Well, thank you again for for being a pioneer and um uh, being a mentor now to, to so many others. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the business case um, for first generation professionals. How do you think organizations and leaders can benefit? Like what, what do they get from providing opportunities to individuals from varying socioeconomic and, and non-professional work backgrounds? This one to me is such an absolute no brainer. Yeah. Organizations thrive on taking in viewpoints from the widest array of different people of different backgrounds. I actually, when I was early on in my career, wondered why is this person mentoring me? Like I'm getting so much out of it. Why are they doing this? As I grew on in my career and became the mentor, here's the secret. Yeah. The mentors get so much more out of it than the mentees because you see in your mentor, the, in your mentee, I'm sorry, the potential. Um, you see a little bit of yourself as a younger person in that 
position and hoping that you can help others not make the same mistakes um, that you've made. I also think we better serve our clients, our stakeholders, whoever they are. Um, I, for years, worked at a very large bank and a multinational bank, and it was interesting that on the consumer side of the bank, the top executives rode the subway in New York City because they needed to see what their customers were experiencing. Yeah. What were the ads on the subway? What were the fads that they were seeing? And so this importance of being connected to your community as your community evolves, as it becomes diverse, as it changes. Um, another benefit is something that our secretary has stressed, yeah. which is it helps diversity, a diverse workforce, helps to avoid groupthink. And groupthink can too frequently lead to mistakes. And so that to me is an affirmative plus. And then the final thing I'll note is a bit intangible, but yeah. it is just equity. It's, it's equitable. And as someone who has so benefited, who has lived that vaunted American dream, it yeah. is part of of giving back. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's it's part of our our fabric as as uh, as Americans to um, uh, have the opportunities uh, to have economic uh, mobility. Um, speaking as uh, the son of immigrants, that's certainly the reason I mean, my parents came to this country was for for economic opportunities that just just weren't there uh, at the time in in India. We've talked about this uh, a little bit already, uh, but I wanted to give you the opportunity uh, to share a little more because I feel like this is an area where you're you're very Im impassioned. And uh, in, in terms of paying it forward, you've mentored many. Um, what do you see as the primary responsibility as as first generation professionals for uh, to mentorship? Um, you might find my answer a little bit odd. I think your primary responsibility is to do your job. And yep. this isn't just for first generation professionals. I've been fortunate in that I have gotten every job in my life because of having done my last job well. Yep. And so whether you are um, your parents and grandparents and great grandparents or professionals, or whether you're a first generation, I think your first responsibility is doing the job well. What I would put second is look out yeah. for your family. Um, and I think that immigrant families pride themselves on the tightness that they have at the yeah. connection. And particularly as a first generation professional to recognize that you can bring back to your family. And as in many immigrant families, your extended family, yeah. um, you can help them on their journey to becoming professionals, if that's the, the path that your siblings, your cousins want to take. Um, I think giving back, and there are so many different ways of giving back. Um, I want to thank the many people who are on today who contributed to the combined federal campaign. That's one way of giving back. But what I'm always struck by when I look at the CFC is if you look through the charities that are listed there, just the breadth of what they cover. And so yeah. there's no one right way of giving back. I think the charity that works best, the public service that works best is the one that moves you uh, because yeah. you're more likely to, to stick with it, to be inspired. Um, I do think there is a responsibility to recognize that you represent more than yourself. If Marisa fails, Many in the world will look and say, oh, it's not just that she wasn't up to it. She made a mistake. They can sit there and say a woman failed. Oh, look at that Hispanic woman. She failed. And I think that this is a pressure that many of us first generation professionals put upon ourselves. Um, it may be why many of us are always overprepared um, because of recognizing that the downside risks can harm more than just us um, individually. My next responsibility is one that I found very hard to do earlier on in my career, 
which is the importance of telling your story. Um, left to my own devices, I hate talking about myself. I'd much rather talk about a wonky subject. I am a real policy geek, yeah. but I learned a number of decades ago at this time, at, at, at by now, that it's important to tell your story because it might allow someone else to find a point of connection to have the confidence to try something else. And my final observation is relative to the point in my career in which I am, which is I actually view my primary responsibility as investing in the future of looking at my generation as having done so much to foul up the world and looking to pass along whatever nuggets of wisdom that might help uh, make things better and help the future generations not make the same mistakes that I did. Thank you. And I, I want to underscore the importance of um, feeling comfortable sharing your diversity story with others. Um, and the I think what we do in DEA is build a, a, a workplace where employee feel like their their voices can be can be shared and and heard. And we all have diversity stories, um, which is why I think you know diversity is 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 owned by all of us. Now we do have some um, first generation professionals uh, that are at various stages in their career. Um, any specific advice? You, you you've already hit on some advice for those that were start that are starting their career. How about those that? might feel like they're hitting a ceiling, whether it's the glass ceiling, a bamboo ceiling, um, or first generation professionals who, who feels like you know they 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 started off, things were going smoothly, but all of a sudden they kind of hit a hit a little bit of a wall. Is there any specific advice you'd give those? Um, don't torture yourself. Reinvent yourself. If you find yourself in a toxic environment um with a bad boss being stymied, just step back and recognize that you can put yourself in a different job. Now that's always a challenge and there, there are risks to that. Um, but that staying in a bad situation, if it's not gonna work out, uh, and as someone who is stubborn and will say, I can get through this, I can get through this, recognizing when it is time. The other is as part of reinventing yourself, um, consider whether it makes sense to take on new skills. And the skills that I would note that at least I didn't have a lot of preparation for in school were writing, public speaking, and negotiating. Now, I, I was fortunate that writing and negotiating uh, I think being the eldest, negotiating just came yeah. as naturally as could be. Um, but public speaking was something that I was absolutely terrified of. And so putting myself in a situation of low stress public speaking, a lunch and learn at my workplace, and just picking up this skill and recognizing that that can be part of um, reinventing yourself. I think the most important thing is not to lose confidence. Being in a in the wrong work environment, um, having made the wrong choice, it can corrode your confidence. And yeah. so don't let that corrosion of confidence stop you from taking the affirmative uh, steps to find a workplace situation that works better for you and gives you more opportunities. Thank and recognize that all of us in a long career have jobs that were absolute mistakes. I, I, I agree. We um, sometimes I think are, are too hard on, on ourselves. Um, and uh, as as we earlier shared, sometimes as first generation professionals, we we carry that extra burden of feeling like we represent, you know, our, our gender or, or our our ethnicity. Now, um, the last question I have before we move into the Q&A, so for those of you um, who are kind enough to join us today, we hope uh, you have some, some questions ready for the Undersecretary. Uh, 
But the last question I have for you, Undersecretary, is is many who are first uh, in their family to navigate these, as we said, uncharted waters of the professional ranks and in professional white collar occupations have expressed a fear of failure, um, a fear of taking career risks. Uh, how did you overcome your fear of potentially failing and, and the risk of not taking a new opportunity? I think that I was probably lucky that I failed early. Um, I was my high school's valedictorian, but this was not a particularly academic high school. The first teacher that I ever had that had a master's degree was my physics teacher. And so I don't think it's any surprise that I became a physics undergrad. Yeah. It's the first time I had to open a book um, and actually work at something because she recognized that my acting out in school was because I was bored and so challenged me with my physics classes. So here I go, never having seen anything but an A, off to Cooper Union, but from a bad school. I show up and there are kids from Bronx Science, from Stuyvesant, some of the most yeah. competitive exam schools sure. that focus on science and math. My first physics test, my first semester of freshman year, I got a D and boy, was that a wake up call. Um, I then failed again. I got a full tuition scholarship. I even got paid to study math at Brown. I dropped out in my first semester, not because I wasn't getting A's, but because I hated it. Um, I had become a more political and social creature and just saw my world narrowing into just studying algorithms. Um, so I think that those were actually good lessons that you could do something and say, no, this is not, not right for me. I do think it is important you use the word risk. And yeah. I think it's important to know your risk appetite. And it is entirely proper if you have family responsibilities to say, I am going to take a career path yeah. that has low risk because I need the paycheck. I need the health benefits. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate in that my husband is also a first generation professional. And we had two careers that allowed us to be risk takers, yeah. um, wow. allowed us. And I'm, I'm emphasizing that because my yeah. husband took no risk. He stayed at one firm for over 30 years, finding satisfaction, whereas I have had a very, very high risk. Um, I don't know if it's exactly your question, Junish, but yeah. part, I think, of this failing um, is something that I think most, many, I won't say most, many first generation professionals have, and that is the imposter syndrome and thinking, okay, I've done good so far, but when are they going to figure out that I'm not up to it? It's a, it's a very deeply corrosive. Um, yeah. And I'll note, I mentioned earlier that early, very early on in my career, I was the special assistant to the chair of the city planning commission. Um, Fast forward, um, I was very proudly working for the Obama Biden administration as an assistant secretary of the treasury when Mayor de Blasio was elected. And the gentleman who had been the chair of the planning commission, uh, whose special assistant I was, he was by this point into his 80s, and Mayor de Blasio asked him for recommendations on who should run the city planning commission. And so he approached me and my reaction was, I'm working for President Obama, like don't talk to me. Yeah. But fast forward, there was an election, President Trump was elected as a political appointee. I was out of a job and he approached me again. Yeah. And um, asked, there was turnover in the position, would I be interested? And I was approached by two of my mentors who yeah. had held this position before me, asking me to consider the job. And I remember speaking to a dear girlfriend saying, how could I ever do this job? Two of the lions in my life, two of the people I most respect did this job. I can't fill their shoes. And this girlfriend over the phone, almost literally slapped both sides of my face and said, wake up, Lago.
the people who are asking you are the ones who have done it and yeah. had this confidence in you. But the fact that that far on in my career, I was still grappling with the imposter syndrome, I think gives wow. a sense of how pernicious it is. Wow. Well, thank you for, for sharing um, so much uh, about, uh, about your journey as a first generation professional. Uh, I just found it fascinating and always so much uh, enjoy chatting with you. And and thank you for sharing, you know, some of the struggles you've had. I think a lot of time leaders want to put up this uh, facade of invulnerability and um, you by, by sharing, um, you know, some of your, your uh, challenges um, just, just come across as so much more, more human, uh, but you are a lion. So it's no wonder <laughs> that uh, you were asked, uh, to uh, take that position in the, the city planning uh, in, in New York City. So um, thank you again for uh, for participating in this uh, discussion. And I'm now going to give the opportunity. We're going to turn it over to our audience. So uh, Laura, I think I'm going to hand the mic back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Junish, and thank you, Under Secretary Lago. Uh, we are now going to move into the Q&A portion of today's event. If you can, please, I do see some hands up already. Uh, Ms. Victoria Tucker, who is also on today, will call you by name once you have your hand lifted. If you can, please, once you've asked the question, if you can uh, put your hand down. If you've asked a question in the chat, I will go ahead and read as many as we have time for today. Uh, so Victoria, can you please uh, have our first question, please? Yes, we have a hand raised by Iris Capo. Hi, Under Secretary Lago. Good to see you. I just want to um, thank you for your inspiring remarks. My name is Iris Capo and I'm a first generation professional from Albania. And I've been uh, with ITA now for over 10 years. I co-lead ITA's coaching program. And I just first want to say thank you for acknowledging our new coaches that joined our team back in August. That personal message meant a lot to us and the work that we're doing because it's in addition to our main responsibilities and we do it from a place of wanting to to give back and serve in this way. And just thank you for supporting these types of programs because I know you know how meaningful they are. But it means a lot to have that leadership from you and to sustain the effort. Um, so just a big thanks for that. My question to you, and you touched on this a little bit, uh, a lot actually, but maybe um, a bottom line on it is if you could do it all over again and not from a place of regret, but from a place of uh, kind of hindsight is 2020, what would you do differently or more of? The biggest thing that you would say you would do differently or more of? You said something really important, Iris, which is it's not from a place of regret. I'm not one who wishes I could do it over. Um, and th this answer is a bit of a double edged sword. Um, I was so incredibly fortunate to go to Cooper Union because it was tuition free. And it was an extraordinary education and because I met my husband there. So like that's a pretty winning combination. Um, but um, I also had a very narrow education. Um, I never took an economics class. I never took a political science class. I never took anything but physics, math and engineering. And I do think that breadth of education um, would have served me far better. Now, through reading, through on-the-job learning, but I guess I would just turn it into, the, the advice would be keep up your intellectual curiosity. You never know how something that you do earlier on in your career may reflect, may help you do your next job better. I'll, I'll note that um, when we were in um, Kazakhstan, I asked, us, I, I love speaking with central bank governors, not something that commerce folks generally do that much of, but drawing on the fact that I had worked at Treasury before and had the familiarity, we ended up, the, the ambassador was thrilled because he was a very hard person to get a meeting with, and we were able to get insights 
that helped our team have a better appreciation of what was going on in the, in the country. So just be be intellectually curious. Thank you. That's amazing. And if I make make a quick request is to continue to have your advocacy for professional development funds and to support these types of programs so we can further our curiosity and expand our skills. That is so meaningful to retain talent. So thank you so much. Thanks, Iris. Thank you so much for that question, Iris. And we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, for you, Secretary, um, Under Secretary Lago. Um, Laura, if you wanted me to read the first one, I can go ahead. Yes, please. Thank you, Victoria. Okay. So, uh, Crystal Hammond asked, What do you do for self care? Um, a lot. I um, have been incredibly fortunate to have met my life partner when I was very young. Uh, Ron and I have been together for 48 years, and that gives a stability of love. Family is everything to me. I have three kid brothers who live in far corners of the globe, and yet we go out of our ways for opportunities to not just speak with each other, but see each other. And um, I would say that um, the two biggest gifts that my mother gave me was one, always writing a thank you note, and two, her gift for making friends. And so I have been fortunate throughout my career to make friends. And um, anyone who has interacted with me frequently knows that I love jewelry. And so I think of my friends as a necklace of gems, and each of them is a different precious stone, but I, I carry them with me, I wear them, um, proudly. I was uh, yesterday in New York for a series of fabulous meetings, including with a number of our USIACs. And um, the, our meetings ended and had about an hour and a half before the train, the Amtrak, back to DC, and met with two friends at Penn Station for a quick get together. One, a friend from 1979 when we entered law school together, and another, a more recent friend who I met when she was general counsel of another agency during the Obama-Biden administration. And they are the, they bring joy to my life. Um, the other thing is that we all have different hobbies that, that give us joy. Um, I happen to love to cook. I love to bicycle. Reading a novel is one of the world's delights. And so it is important to, to take pleasure. Um, the other thing that I would emphasize to folks is the extreme importance of taking vacation. We are given vacation time for a reason. We need the time to disconnect um, and to refresh ourselves. We don't do our best work when we are when we're fried. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. I do see some hands up, uh, but let me, I'm um, going to go through a couple of questions that kind of came through the chat a little bit earlier. Uh, one of the questions here is, uh, let me scroll down again. Um, any tips for making connections and striking up conversations? With the with the big wigs in today's virtual environment, and um, do we have the the question around where they are? Because I do find it helpful just as a way of getting oh, yes. to know folks Crystal. on the team. Crystal, are you are you on? Perfect. Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> thank you. I actually so too. So I'm glad you mentioned your mom does that. But the like, I feel like people feel like they're like impossible to reach or impossible to contact. Like if you send an email, you're gonna um, get their gatekeeper maybe and not be important enough to make it through the tape. So any tips? Yeah. Um, which is you don't have to get the big wigs. And who is a big wig varies, you know, depending upon context. So to me, it's human connection. And um, 
I think all of us have learned through the pandemic, one, that we can communicate virtually, but boy, how much more we love the, the personal connection. Mm -hmm. And so there is so much learning to be done with your colleague and interaction with someone at a different agency. Look for the opportunity. And what's fortunate, I used to say, say send a letter, a U.S. Postal Service stamp is cheap. It's even cheaper today. Send an email. What's the worst that can happen? It gets ignored. And sometimes it doesn't. And so just look for that point of connection. And I can't emphasize enough, when you walk into a meeting room, there are always chit chats going on, on the margins of the meeting. And sure, you might not be the focus of the meeting, but you're in the room. And so take advantage of it. When you're in the elevator, talk to the other person who's in the elevator. Now, have some emotional intelligence. If you see someone on the elevator and they're clearly thinking, I mean, I know there are times that I'm on the elevator and I'm getting into the mental space for a really tough meeting. And my whole body language probably says, like, don't talk to me now. <laughs> um, but that, say hello to someone in the hallway. Just look for the human connection and don't take rejection personally. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for the good questions, Crystal. Thank you, Undersecretary Lago, and thank you, Crystal. Uh, we do have about three, four minutes for a couple of questions, Victoria, if you'd like to take some from the hands that are raised. Yes, thank you, Laura. So our first participant raised her hand, Rafael. If you'd like to come online and um, ask your question. Yes, great, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, Undersecretary Lago. Um, I enjoyed your stories, and uh, I said earlier that we'll just cut as the uh, as the uh, for your duffel bag story. Um, that was great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, so I am a first uh, generation professional, and I was thinking, how do I continue? Uh, what advice do you have in continuing that legacy into our uh, future, our children, uh, as second generation professionals, third generation professionals, because <clears throat> personally for me, what I remember, um, I wanted to be an actor and uh, you know, I was really into the arts uh, and my dad uh, said, no, you are not doing that. And my mom said, no, you're not doing that. My dad from Mexico, my mother from South America, from Colombia, they were like, we did not go through all this trial and tribulation for you to be an actor, uh, so you have three choices. You're gonna be a, guess what? A doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Which one are you going to be? Uh, and so um, I picked an engineer and, and that's what I do in life. And it's proved to be a very handsome uh, career. Um, so long story short, um, how do we get our second generations and our third generations to understand that legacy that is that's pushed them to be where they are and having that decision. What what advice do you have for for us on that? Oh, that's a hard one, right? Um, because those of us who are the first generation, we have a foot in in both worlds. Um, when I took my first international job, I'd never worked internationally. I did not have a second doubt that I was meant for it because you grow up in two, in two different worlds. You understand that as proud as you are to be an American, that you also know that there's another way of living that has, has value um, to it. For me, I was so fortunate to grow up in a multi-generational family. And I do think that that is one way of, of having a legacy of hearing the stories. Um, I, I'm not a parent, and so I haven't confronted that. Uh, yeah. So I'm sorry, I don't have advice other than to know that we've having a foot in both worlds is both hard, but it's also a point of pride. And I'm sure that you're passing that along to your children. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. And I, I do apologize we weren't able to get through all of them and to everyone that had their hands raised. Um, in the interest of time and respecting Undersecretary Lago's time and everyone who attended today, I would like to, on behalf of the Office of Civil Rights, thank you, Undersecretary Lago, for joining us today, sharing your story. I know I 
the tips that you gave, and I'm thoroughly impressed and thankful for you being here today. Junish, Aurora, thank you so much for moderating today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Jerry Beat, who is the director of the Office of Civil Rights. Jerry, if you're on, can you please? There we go. Thank you. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and uh, thank you, Undersecretary Lago, for sharing your story. Wow, what a powerful interview. You know, it's really interesting that uh, Raphael asked that, uh, raised that question to you, because when I was giving thought about what a first generation professional initiative means to me, I can speak as the son of a first generation professional. Um, and the legacy continues on to the next generation. I can affirm that as being that part of that legacy. My mom uh, was got her master's degree in the early 60s, uh, being Mexican-American, the first in a, her, our immigrant family on her side as a woman in that era to get a master's degree um, and working professionally. And I grew up watching her full of that admiration, who later went on to, to, to become involved in the Chicano civil rights movement it's, it, uh, also. So that legacy continues and what that, that, that just taught me so much. And that I continue to pay that back also. The way I did that was teaching English as a second language in the Latino community for over 15 years and doing this work that I'm in now. So I can tell you that if you are first generation professionals, your experience impacts your children and others around you without a doubt so it's really interesting Raphael. i hope i hope uh that is uh, uh, helps answer part of your question and it's just really wonderful that that came up right now so again thank you uh under secretary lago for your story it's just uh, uh, amazing and we can never hear these stories and sharing uh from a leader internally um, and from our employees, it's really impactful. Um, so I also want to thank Junish, of course, and for sharing his story and being a masterful interviewer. Um, and thank you, Laura, for helping organize today's event and to Cisco Roman for interpreting as well. So lastly, I want to thank all of you on this call uh, for taking time from your day and possibly your lunch or breakfast to be a part of this event. So by participating, you are helping the Department of Commerce elevate diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility. Of course, I cannot close today's program without mentioning that we are approaching Black History Month, which starts February 1st, and OCR is definitely planning a dynamic commemorative event. So please keep an eye out for the broadcast announcing the event in early February. And for more information about equity at the department and to learn about the department's DEIA strategic plan um, and the council, uh, please visit the equity page, which is found on the main DOC website, very prominently posted with two great video messages from the secretary and the Dep deputy secretary as well. Um, for more information about the Office of Civil Rights, please visit our website as well. We have information about DEIA, Equal Employment Opportunity, and our special emphasis program, and that's www.doc.gov forward slash CR. So thank you everybody for being here. See you in February, and this concludes today's FGP event. Take care. Thank you.